Hello everybody and welcome back for another subscribers game and this picture is amazing I've actually never seen this picture before and it may or may not be a fact that the only reason I do so many replays is to see those cool pictures I don't know if you can see them anywhere else in this game um, and really I'm discovering them along with you um, I don't know if you noticed that before but anyway moving swiftly on um, I've been given this replay by Iselendil and here he is um, playing in his traditional purple colours um, and if you didn't know, um, Isolendil's favourite matchup is 2v2. It's his favourite game type, I should say. So, if in doubt, I will be focusing on Isolendil um, above anyone else. Just simply because he's the one that um, sent in the replay. And that's usually what I do. So, here we see he's creeping. And actually, he hasn't switched into the shield wall formation. So, he's actually probably going to take a couple losses against these um, wildmen. Now, it's not the end of the game. It's not like he's going to uh, lose the game for him. But um, I at least always go for the shield wall formation, even when I'm against creeps that I know I'm not going to lose the battalion, because Gondor troops are reasonably strong. I'm not going to lose the battalion, but it's always just nice to suffer less damage. Anyway, moving on from that point, and actually, let's just see what he's, what he's doing here. Okay, so he's just about got enough for a Gondor soldier, and yes, indeed, he does go for it, and he's also gone for a, uh, an inside building, and he's gone for townhouses, so that suggests to me that he will be going for um, the tower guards, and also potentially the uh, rangers. Now, if you can't tell already, I am watching this for the first time, so really, I don't know what's going to happen. And once again, he's not going into shield wall formation there. Um, yeah, I haven't seen this game before, so I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the plans are of the players, so I'm, I'm um, seeing live view. So, here we are. Mordor, and it's played by Enad, or should I say Danny, as he's more commonly known. Um, so... That'd be nice to see. Um, and actually, I haven't really observed Danny that much. I mean, I used to observe him when I was a real big noob, and I didn't know how to play the game. And we used to play team games together, and he was one of the players that I'd look to because I'd heard that he was very good at playing the game. So really, I, I, um, in my very early days, I would copy him and see what he was doing. Along with other players like um, Iranian um, and Jorin, who, who's an excellent dwarf player, but he doesn't play that much um, these days. So yes, he's gone for a gore bag. He's gone for uh, a barracks, and he's going for some um, early inside buildings. Now, it's one of those cases, and so does Slendor here. Uh, it's one of those cases where, in team games in particular, it's it's a much better option to go for those inside early buildings um, than it is in one v ones. At least that's how I see it. So, Slendor looks like he's pumped out a few troops. Um, he's continuing the Gondor spam, but I'm sure he'll be um, looking to tech into tower guards um, once he's built up his eco a little bit stronger. So enough about those two, let's go over to see who they're playing against. And we've got a dwarf player, and it's Dudster, and he's playing Ered Lewin. Um, Ered Lewin, Erebor. So um, usually you see Dud playing Mordor, and in fact in 1v1s he plays almost exclusively Mordor. Um, but in team games, he does switch it up a little bit because um, he himself admits that he's not so good in, in 1v1s and he is a lot better in uh, team games. So therefore, he can, um, I assume, allow himself to pick different factions um, because he's a little bit more confident uh, in team games. Once again, not going into the shield wall formation. Now, in this situation, it's not so bad because if you didn't know, the shield wall formation reduces your speed by 30%. And as you see here, Dud isn't actually fighting. So it, it is the best idea to go out of this shield wall formation. If Dud was fighting him, then of course you switch back into it. And really, this is the problem with uh, dwarves, is their speed. So you see here, the Gondor units are chasing them down. Now, Dud turns to fight. Um, and actually, that was a nice bit of micro there. You see that um, banner carrier? His, uh, the Gondor units were targeting um, those two bat uh, battalions of Erebor. You see the two of them have survived. Now, he was targeting a level 2 battalion, and they were about to be killed. However, he kind of blocked it off with his other battalion and managed to keep the banner carrier. So, a very, very nice macro there from Dud. Um, here we see Danny just going ahead and creeping the troll, getting a f few hits in on Gorbag, which isn't uh, the best thing to do, especially if your enemy comes in to attack. Uh, but I'm sure he'll be able to keep him alive. Particularly because Danny has got very good micro. So here we see the other player. And I actually don't know who it is. So who is it? Um, he's playing him largest. And it's Andy. So Andy, another very good player. So four very good players in this match in a 2v2. So this should be really um, an interesting and a close match. So as we see there, and, and I don't know if you noticed before. But Dud actually went for a complete eco rush. Um, 
And with dwarves, it's probably not that bad of an idea. And actually, he hasn't even creeped this. So really, he wasn't pumping out troops. And he wasn't pumping out troops to the point of not even being able to creep his um, wildman over here. And Isselendor, thanks to his um, very early Gondor spam, he's managed to get out quite a lot of troops. So really, he's putting some early pressure on um, on Dud here, and that is what you should be doing. That is really um, the sacrifice that Dud made for going for all those. As we just watch this little battle uh, commencing here, these these units are surrounded, so really they're going to suffer damage. And I remember when I when I was a noob and I used to play against Danny. Really, um, he used to surround my units so often, and I used to lose a lot. But thanks to the um, hobbits, they've managed to battle. The, uh, they've managed to save the uh, largest battalion there. So yes. Um, Dud went for extremely strong eco, which I'm not going to say is a bad decision in team games, because because really, if your enemy doesn't counter it well, it, it can become um, a very good decision. However, Isselendil has done exactly what he needed to do in that position, and that was because he had favoured spamming um, troops, really he's put on extremely early pressure on Dud here, and he's taken these outside farms, and he's actually captured them, um, as we see here. So the eco boost that he gets from that is probably going to compensate for the extremely early inside economy that Dud has gone for. What's more, he's stolen some of Dud's creeps. So that's really what you want to do. If your enemy goes for an eco rush, and you go for spam, the only way to make his eco rush... Um, the only way to prove his eco rush as a bad decision is to put on that extremely early pressure when you outnumber him so significantly with troops. Now I have noticed something which you may not have noticed on the minimap, and that was that Isselendil has gone for an extremely early outpost. Now this is one of the things that I don't like um, doing, because I do believe, um, although I said in the last video about Angmar, about how safe it can be, really um, Gondor is a different example, where they don't have um, so much defensive capabilities in that their citadel doesn't get archers. And really, if your enemy has um, decided to pump out a lot of troops, really, you're not going to have enough units to defend against um, the attack. That being said, Gondor do get a uh, rebuild, so that can help you out uh, if you rush for an outpost like Esselendil has done there. However, having said that, um, Dud went for the eco start. So, really, in this position, it's not a bad decision for Esselendil to go for that, in my opinion. Because, really, he can afford to go for that in this position. Because look how many more troops he's got than Dud. Dud didn't go for a barrack star, and in fact he went for completely eco star, and he built all of his eco buildings, and he started to begin to upgrade his eco buildings, even before he, even before he got his barracks out. So really now he's going to have to spam a lot of troops to catch up with this Elendil here. So, yes, this Elendil has rushed for the outpost, which very often is a bad decision. However, it's not a bad decision in this situation, because he can afford it, thanks to the amount of troops that he's got. As we see here, Andy has gone for some cavalry, uh, which is, uh, they're extremely good, the cavalry of, um, uh, Imlardris, if I can get that sentence out in time. Yes, and this is why they're so good. Ride them down. Now, if you didn't know, it actually um, reduces the amount of, that they're slowed by units. 50% um, slower, trample deceleration, if you can read that there. They also get a plus 30% movement speed. Now, the plus 30% movement speed makes them a counter to cavalry. They make them an anti-cavalry cavalry, as I've mentioned before in some videos. But this plus 50% slower um, trample deceleration really makes them excellent at um, anti-spam. Now, that wasn't a great example of it, because really the clump was a bit beyond the power of just one battalion of um, Rivendell Lancers. But if you can get one or two battalions out of Rivendell Lancers, really that clump will be demolished, which one or two battalions of, say, Gondor uh, troops, which suffer quite a bit from trample deceleration, really, th if, you cl if you clump effectively, really, um, th you can deal quite a lot of damage to um, cavalry in that way, even though there's no packs involved in there. In the meantime... Um, it's Elendil here, coming in and attacking the troops. And it looks like Dud's decided to go for a bit of a um, axe thrower spam. A little bit of queuing there, but not, not too bad queuing. Um, because that is very soon to be um, produced. Now, actually, I quite like this um, strategy here from Dud. To go for the axe throwers. Now, I wouldn't do that personally myself under my playstyle, but because of this very um, strong eco that he's got in his base, really probably that is quite a good idea, because it w once again, it's going to counter this um, this infantry spam that um, Isselendil has gone for, and really probably um, does can afford to start to spam these axe throwers. Um, quite early on in this game, thanks to the fact that he's got such a strong economy. Whereas if you'd gone for a strategy like mine, right, where you go for a much earlier barracks, potentially you wouldn't be able to spam out that many axe throwers. 
Now, the other thing about Axe Rose is, yes, they're excellent. Yes, their damage is, is so, so huge. But they're slow, just like any other dwarf. So if you get outnumbered num by um, infantry, you have to be very careful not to lose them. Because if your enemy targets your axe throwers um, with faster troops, really you can't run away from them. Um, so you have to have a bit of a tanking army like um, guardians or... Um, some pikes there. Really, you'd only get pikes to counter, counter cavalry, but guardians there to tank, and then you use the axe throwers to deal the damage. Really, that's where the axe throwers start to shine. Once again, they're not so good by themselves against fast troops. And look at that. The clump of Mordor managed to destroy that um, battalion of cavalry. Now, that's quite a big loss. Um, in big part, it was thanks to the... Um, Kirithungal Pikes, as well as these archers as well deal a lot of damage. Now, archers are good against elite units in general, just because elite units have so few uh, units in their battalions. And archers are such a good counter to that. Um, so really, uh, some people don't, don't rate um, Enlarger's Cavalry as much as I do. And the reason for that is because they have so few units in their battalion. So it's actually quite easy to destroy a battalion. However, if you use... Um, and look at the axe throwers coming in here. Really, really quite devastating. And if I was done now, I would be focusing the pikes. Which it looks like potentially he is. Um, at least for some of his units, he's, he's focusing them. And then I'd ask... Um, Andy to come in and start trampling in areas where I have destroyed the pikes and look at the rain of the cut throwing axes there Really that is quite epic um, And also just to mention it's has gone for some trebuchets So it looked like he was really wanting to end it early However, the axe throw spam has proven to be very useful for dud in this match. They, that was two stones that I saw um, And indeed he does have uh, two catapults and there is the cav in fact and look at that it's destroying the um, The rangers and in come the hobbits now if you didn't know hobbits are extremely powerful in this patch uh, and look at this, look at the, um, look at the cavalry destroying Selendil's troop spam. So that is exactly what um, I would have been doing in this situation. And it looks like Andy and Dud have worked extremely well in combination with each other to destroy the packs. That being said, there are a few there. And if I was at Selendil, I'd really be focusing down these, um, cavalry. Nevertheless, uh, Andy could be targeting the pikes uh, and better utilising his hobbits in that position to do even more damage with his cavalry. All that being said, that was excellent, excellent, excellent news for Dud and Andy in this position. And really it looks like um, Isselendil had taken it to Andy very, very heavily in the early game. And it looked like he was uh, in really big trouble, Dud. But thanks to that nice little bit of play and nice little bit of team play and, and micro decisions there, um, it looks like that actually um, Dud is has very strong chances of destroying these outposts in this position because all those troop spams yes there was all those troops that he's that Selendo spammed out yes they were extremely good in the early game but they're not so good now especially with all these um axe throwers and the constant threat of um the cavalry harassment i would like to draw your attention to the fact that andy has gone for the uh Dunedain outpost i did notice that as well and really that that is very powerful in this patch um the patch fix 2.4 has actually nerfed it quite a bit by reducing the amount of archers on there at least i believe that is the case it certainly is the case with angmars um and he's actually gone for an archer spam now i don't know why excuse me i don't know why he's gone for that actually um the only reason why i would assume he's gone for that is to target the pikes now let's have a look at these pikes indeed they are suffering damage i don't know if that's a if, if that's just a coincidence if that's just a lucky hit or whether he is actually thinking as i would be thinking target the pikes with the archers and then use a cavalry and everything else so maybe that's why he's gone for uh, those archers nevertheless archers in general in my opinion aren't that great against uh, mordor as we saw in the toothless versus dimitri game really because um Archers are, in my opinion, extremely good against uh, elite units, like, um, for example, these enlargers units they're very good against. But against the spam, they're not so great. Because, yes, they're anti-infantry, but really losing orcs isn't a big deal. And also, there's so many of them that it's hard to hit them all with, the, with your archers. So it looks like Danny's also gone for Gothmog, and actually Gothmog level 5. Now that is extremely impressive. It's quite early on in this game, and let me flick through the, the Palantirs. I apologise, I haven't been doing that more in this game. Um, I've got a bit distracted. But yes, he's gone for Gothmog, which is extremely good. And if you didn't know, at level 4, he gets plus 15% damage and plus 50% armour, as well as fear Fearless, um, for the Orcs. Now, look at this. Really, it seems that this Orc spam hasn't worked out very well for um, Andy, as well as this Cavalry, because as you see... Um, uh, Danny in this position has gone for these pikes and the Kirith Ungol pikes as I'm sure you know are extremely good um, against everything even they're not even like um, I mean yes they're good against cavalry but they're one of the units that are good against everything pikes and swordsmen included 
Um, but really, obviously, Danny is using them to counter the cavalry in this position, which is exactly the right decision when you see your enemy getting cavalry out uh, when you're playing Mordor. So it looks like Isselendo managed to push back Dud uh, in this situation, partly probably um, due to this tower being there, and also quite a few ranges that he's got out. Now, uh, I'll focus more on this fight because there's no fighting going on, but I will talk a little bit more about the rangers. And if you saw um, the Ultimate Skill Cup, I don't know if you watched it or watched any of the games in it, but one of the games I played was me um, as Gondor against um, Durin, one of the best Erebor players, playing Dwarves, playing Erebor specifically. Um, and in that game, I really took it to him in the early game. It was quite similar to the, the little match-off uh, that Dud and uh, uh, Isselendor are having. Um, I just I just pause that point for a minute and just say that um, it looks like Danny's attack on the outpost failed. And if you if you see here, citadels um, and this is classed as a citadel, um, they rebuild rebuild so quickly. And as soon as you stop attacking them, they rebuild. And look at the speed that it rebuilds. So really, if you don't destroy it, um, your attack on it is wasted. Really, you have to kill it, otherwise you gain you've gained no advantage. Other than the advantage uh, that. Uh, Danny got in this position by killing the units. So yes, back to that point that I was talking about the rangers. Um, in the game that I played against Jorin, when I was Gondor and he was um, Erebor, here Martha Sauron comes out, I did a very similar strategy in that I pumped out a lot of units to harass um, his farms and really get rid of his mine shafts because, as I've said before, the mine shafts are so important when you're playing as slow dwarves to get yourself all over the match. So I know that if I destroy all of his um, mines, that really... Um, he's not going to be able to have any mobility in the game. And really, that was the case. Now, I combine that with cavalry, which Isselendor hasn't done here. And in fact, Isselendor and Danny don't have cavalry. And when you're playing team games, really, it is a good idea for at least one player to have cavalry. And indeed, for two players to have cavalry is probably a bad decision. It's probably better in team games to have one player focus a little bit on cavalry, while the other focus is on infantry. Now, look at the amount of rangers he's got here. Really, I hardly ever see that many rangers coming out, and he's got some pikes that defend them against um, Andy's uh, cavalry, which he knows will be coming in. I would like to draw, draw your attention to the fact that um, Dud has got so many of his heroes out as well, Thorin the Third in particular. Wow, I keep getting distracted from the point about um, Erebor versus Gondor. But yes, I, w I will finish it now. Um, it was that I used the spam, as Isselendil has done here, to really push him back and really destroy the um, farms, as you saw. Now, that's a lot more effective in 1v1s because you can't have your teammate to come and help you out, as Andy did come to help out Isselendil in this position. Um, or rather, sorry, Andy come out to help Dud in that position to really start to push Isselendil back. But just like Isselendil, I went for the uh, uh, quite heavy um, rangers and also upgraded them to fire arrows. Now, the reason I did that was because I knew that the um, dwarves were slower than the rangers. So really, you can do like a hit and run. And if you've ever played against a, an extremely good um, Lothlorien player, you may notice that a lot of the times they do that. They hit and run. And really, with um, archer, ar heavy, heavy archer-focused uh, armies, you do do quite a lot of that. Hit and run. So you get in range of your archers. You attack. Your enemy pushes to come and attack you. You simply move back a little bit then stop, then attack again. Now, if you're the same speed, it's not such a big deal because you move back, but your enemy um, moves back at the same speed. So really, as soon as you stop, your enemy is going to be catching up to you. However, if you're faster, and look at that, that's a bit of bad micro. If your archers are faster than your, um, than your enemy, then really you can run back, stop, and attack, and they're never going to catch up with you just for the simple fact that they're um, slower. I hope I explained that um, clear enough. But that... That is just um, a very basic thing that, that you might want to employ in your games. Is that, um, and in, in particular, it's um, archers versus dwarves. Is, is That is the reason why archers are so good against dwarves. It's basically you can just um, use hit and run. Now, the counter to that for um, Iron Hills, at least, or at least one of the main counters and probably the best counter, is their um, tower shields, which heavily, heavily reduce the um, amount of damage suffered um, from archers. Now, of course, the other counter is um, battle wagons. I really, that is the only counter for um, Erebor, is battle wagons. Um, and also, possibly, the axe throwers. Now, I don't know what the range of the axe throwers is like. I would assume that the range of the um, Ithilian rangers um, is better than that of the Axe Throwers. But because the Axe Throwers are so powerful and they deal so much damage, really that is a possible counter. The other possible counter is um, Catapults, and simply getting a lot of Dwarven Catapults, which are extremely good, getting them with fire um, boulders, and just hitting your enemy's archers with them. 
and really just destroying the archers in that way because in this patch um, the catapults especially when they have uh, the fire upgrade deal so so much damage to units which really I consider ridiculous because um, yes it's it's a bit of realism if you get hit uh, in the face with a giant catapult you're gonna die but um, I think that the catapults really should be more based around um, destroying buildings that being said it's like if you clump your units, um, the catapults are a lot worse. And as I've been playing a lot of Company of Heroes, really there are st stuff similar to catapults. Um, that being like um, the ranged artillery or like flat guns. But yeah, they're so good at um, anti-infantry. But really there are ways to counter it. And I'm sure there's a way to counter um, the catapult spam as well. So once again, it's one of those situations where really um, it's difficult to determine whether something is over overpowered in that sense. Nevertheless, if it was a choice between uh, a nerf of catapults to units or no nerf, I would probably say nerf it. See see how it how it plays out after that. It would certainly reduce the chances of having catapult battles, which I'm always in favour of. So yes, uh, back to the, back to this match in particular, and it looks like Dud is in some serious trouble here, and he's got his units um, kind of hidden away from um, Isilendo's army. And really, you might be thinking, why don't you just go and attack? But if he does go and attack, really, Isilendo, at least this is what I would do, just start employing the hit and run tactic until Dud's forced way back again, and then just come in with the catapults. So the siege begins of Dud, and. Andy, he's got two battalions of cavalry out. Does he still have... He still has this, and he's going for the horse shields. Now, let's just have a look over the uh, bases a little bit more, which I should have been doing more, instead of talking for ages about um, stuff that isn't even related to this game. Um, but it is related to the mud, at least. Yeah, so it looks like um, completely resource upgrades from Dud. And here we go. Here's, the, here's this big battle. Now, the thing that I would say about Dud uh, in this position is really his heroes are going to be key. However, charging your heroes in with no protection is never a good idea. Um, Isilendo could have had a chance to really try and do some damage to them there. But even trying to fight against Thorin with a giant army, really, most of the time you're going to lose. Especially once he's leveled up. Uh, if you didn't know, Thorin the Third is... is Possibly uh, the most overpowered um, hero, if not the most overpowered thing in this game at the moment. Um, he's he's like the best hero killer who also can just nuke armies. So there you go. And he's got force base on these troops, so that is very nice. And what is going on here? Oh, it's the fire. Oh, very, very nice play. A nice little bit of micro there from Dud. And he set all these units on fire. And fire against um, Isilend um, against Ithilien Rangers. I was going to say Isilendo Rangers then. Is very good. Um, really, they do get destroyed by that. So a nice little bit, bit of uh, micro play there from Dud. To stave off that siege attack, at least for now. But it seems as this Gloin is isolated. And, and here is exactly what I was saying. Yes, heroes are good. But when they're isolated, really, you need people there to defend them and because the units are faster they will kill Gloin in that situation so good micro from um, Dud however it was risky to send him in like that and once you've sent him in like that you really need your units there to protect him so that was a bit of bad micro so um, he kind of went back on himself there with that excellent micro uh, to turn into a bit of bad micro um, so really um, probably he lost out with that move um, with Gloin because he ended up losing him and really, you didn't need to lose him. Now, look at this. Um, Andy has destroyed um, Dog or Door there from Danny. But at the cost of, it would seem, his um, battalion of cavalry, he's got this one um, away. I think he might have even attacked with two. Uh, sorry, with three, and two are dead, and only one survives. But for definite, that one is dead. And let's actually have a look here to see. No, um, Dud and Andy haven't gone for the outpost there. Um, so, really. It, it was a situation where they, uh, Danny and Isilendil's team had more outposts. But thanks to him destroying it, they're actually even on outposts now. Um, but as I um, often think to myself, this this game, Idane, it's not outpost simulator. And I hope it becomes less and less outpost simulator than it is at the moment. So yes, the, uh, the amount of outposts you got, you have is not necessarily representative of who's winning the game, as a lot of um, players sometimes do think. So really here you see that um, Dud, despite the um, huge pushback that um, Isilendil has done, and oh, he's gone for uh, Berrigan there. Berrigan will not survive long, I predict. As, as long as Dud does some decent macro here, if he attacks as he does with um, Bjorn, yeah, that's it. He's dead. He's absolutely dead. No saving there. 
You've got Thorin out, and you've got um, Bjorn, and you've got Gimli in there as well. Really, he was going to definitely die in that situation. So, yes, here you see it. That um, Dud has made an amazing comeback, really, from that siege that was going on earlier. Um, and, and the pushback that he had uh, extremely early on in the game. It seems that this uh, his inside um, base economy has seen him through and, and has given him enough money to, up, uh, to get out his heroes and also upgrade his units. And I like the fact that he's gone for... Has he gone for any... He has gone for heavy armor on his troops as well. I particularly like the fact that he went for forge blades on the axe throwers um, before the guardians. And as you see, he's gone... He's only just now getting forge blades on his guardians. A reason I like that is because it, it suggests that he's um, thinking about splitting his functions in his um, army. He's... The axe throwers have high damage, so giving them forged blades, uh, it's a percentage increase, so it increases it even higher. So really, you use your um, axe throwers as your damage dealers, and you can give he um, heavy armor to your tanking units, which will be your guardians, and in that way you kind of um, have a bit of a division of labor of your troops. In the meantime, Danny has come in with siege, and really you see the power of siege against outposts. And because he's got so many units... It really is he's able to protect his siege and destroy the outposts. That is the disadvantage of um, outposts such as um, the Dunedain camp and such as Dale. Is that, yes, if you attack it and then you have to leave, they get healed so quickly. But they're easier to kill if you manage to kill it. Because it's only one building that you have to kill. Whereas an outpost like Isalendu had there, which was Gondor's, um, you have four buildings. You have to kill four buildings before the thing uh, gets destroyed. So that's something else you have to think about. And it looks like he's gone for the um, Blade Masters of Rivendell, which is always nice to see. Let me just go over to No One's Palantir, so we haven't got the Fog of War on here. Um, I hardly ever use the um, Blade Masters of Rivendell. However, I believe that I should use them more. Um, and I just never really, I never really find the time um, to get them or the money to get them. And sometimes I just favour the... Um, Rivendell Swordsmen, because they have two powers, whereas every other th everything else has only one. But I'm sure that the um, Blade Masters are very, very powerful in certain situations. And one of those situations would be versus Mordor, where the vast majority of your army has no for um, heavy armor, which is the speciality of uh, the Masters, the Blade Masters of Rivendell. The only exception to that rule would be um, the Soldiers of Rune, but you have to use the Eye of Sauron um, on your Tribute Camp, or rather the influence of Sauron on your Tribute Camp, to get Heavy Armor and Forge Blades on those summoned troops. So yes, in the early game, Isalendil had the outpost up here while Dud was being pushed back, whereas um, Andy had the outpost down here, and um, Danny was getting a bit pushed back by that cavalry. But, as we see here, it's completely switched up, and... The outposts have changed, and now, um, and he's actually gone for Dale here. I'm not quite sure why he's gone for Dale. I personally would have gone for um, the other outpost that um, the dwarves get, which I do believe is superior to Dale. Um, I mean, of course, Dale has his advantages, um, namely the fast troops, for one thing. And let me just take a sip of my coffee. It's going cold already, even though it's black coffee. It's got no milk in it. Um, yes, obviously... Dale has its advantages. It's very good at resource production and it's got fast troops, which um, often is the case that Erebor are in desperate need of some fast troops. However, um, in terms of economy um, and in terms of um, healing your dwarven units that already exist and um, getting out some siege and the defensive capabilities of the other outposts, because you can get three um, outposts, uh, so you can get three battle towers on that. Um, really is one of the best defences, um, the best defended outposts in the game, if not the best defended outpost, because you can get potentially six upgraded um, Forge Blaze towers on it, which is just completely ridiculous. So actually, I think, th like, theoretically, it it's better in terms of, uh, in terms of economy, in terms of um, defence, but obviously uh, Dale has its merits, and it seems that um, Dud wants to prove me wrong here, and show that actually Dale is the correct decision. Now look at this, this really is the power of Mordor, and once, once again we see Danny surrounding um, units, uh, the superior units of the dwarves, but if they get surrounded by the Mordor clump, then really they get destroyed. However, epic, epic um, flood there from Andy. And already he's got his level 10 power, so ser he seriously killed a lot of orcs uh, in this game. And I will take a little bit of time just to cycle through um, the Palantirs, which I sh should have done more. Once again, I said I'd do it more, but I didn't. Um, so, yes, and it looks like Mordor's got quite a lot of power points as well, and he's got darkness ready. However, if we sw switch back over to Andy for just one second, here he has the light of all men. So, excellent. He's preemptively countered... Um, the darkness of um, Danny. So if Danny casts darkness, straight away um, Andy is going to cast 
um, cast the Light of All Men, which is basically a cloud break, and it will completely nullify darkness. Look at the axe throwers coming in. Now, upgraded axe throwers, and look at um, Thor in there. He just, doesn't, he just doesn't care at all. I think Gimli might have died in that situation, did he? Um, and there goes Gloin, and yes, Gloin dies as well. So really, the uh, the hero battle is in Danny's favour, as it so often is, because Danny's hero micro is one of the best um, in the whole of Udain. So it seems as if Dud, and actually, here's an easy way to tell. Yes, Dud did lose Gimli, and I'm sure he lost him in that battle. Um, Gimli 2000, I didn't know that was part of the patch. Um, so yes, he's lost him, and ooh, is that, who, who is that? Is that Dud who's done that? It's not Dud, it is... Um, Andy, so after me praising him about preemptively countering uh, darkness, it seems that he's he's actually wasted, in my opinion, this ability because now Danny can freely use um, darkness. Um, I mean, the counter to it would be uh, Dud if he goes for Durin's Day in this situation. So look at this. It seems as if Danny really has suffered quite a lot of damage to his army, and really it was thanks to Dud coming in with his upgraded dwarves. Um, and didn't it actually play a part in that fight? It was really just Danny versus um, Dud in that. Um, well, of course, Andy played a part in the huge flood, which destroyed, absolutely decimated so many of um, Danny's orcs. So really, it looks like Isalendil and Danny have been pushed back in this situation. And this is the power of dwarves once they start to get upgraded troops. And in particular, and probably above all else, once Thorin begins to level up, he becomes uh, an unstoppable force in himself. And yes, the orc spam is so good. It, it, it's so, so good. But in my opinion, really, it shines most of all in 1v1s. Just because of the map control you can get with it. Whereas in team games, and, and how difficult it is to counter just all by yourself, the orc spam. Um, but in team games, it's a lot different because it's not so easy to grab and maintain map control from your enemies. Um, in team games. So I think the Orcs map isn't so good in team games. However, um, that's not to say that it's terrible. And, and indeed, it is very good in team games. And Dud has used it against me and beaten me in team games with the spam. So look at this now. Dud has got this upgraded army. And really, this is a situation where Dud is keeping his units alive thanks to the um, Forge Blades, which is reducing the amount of units that are attacking his because they're just killing them so fast. And also the upgraded uh, Guardians, which have heavy armor. So it's a lot more difficult to kill them. And really, Andy has started to get a late game. Um, Enlarge's army here as well. And Andy has put a beacon down. So they realise that this outpost is here. So I'm sure that is the next plan. is for them to go over and destroy that outpost. And Isalendil in this position really hasn't gotten um, any upgrades on his troops. And I would just like to draw your attention. Oh, he's used uh, Denethor here to get some cheaper troops. Um, so these can't get upgrades. So I never really use that. Just because I think it's a very short term uh, advantage. Um, that really you can't use it in the long term. However, it might be pretty good under certain situations as is so often the case in a well-made um, real-time strategy game. Um, just because you don't use something uh, and you might consider it to be um, useless, actually you find situations where it is useful. But he hasn't gone for tower guards in this situation as I predicted he might because of the um, town hall. Now, it, those town halls haven't gone to waste because of that earlier ranger spam, but the ranger tent, which I believe was here, has now actually been destroyed. So really, these are doing nothing. And really, he would be in a better position to have had um, blacksmiths as the game has turned out. The dwarves, gone. <sighs> Just another sip of my coffee there. As it turned out, he may have it may have been more beneficial for him to go for the blacksmith. Um, but once again, that's only because it turned out that way. Um, if it had gone better for Isalendil in this match, um, those um, town halls may have proved more effective. Uh, but that's all hypothetical. So here now, it, it seems that Dud is really starting to build um, a much more concrete position over the map. And if he can manage to get these heroes back out and manage not to lose them, um, really he will start to build an unstoppable force. And this is... Uh, this is one of the things I was saying. Like, he's filled up his inside base, and he's got this Dale, and yes, Dale is good, and it's a bit cheaper than the other one, but really, if he'd gone for the normal outpost, he could start to get some siege out here and start to think about um, destroying Isalendil in this match and having the match finished. Now, here we see um, Andy, is, um, Danny has decided to come over here with his army, and he's got some more siege out. So, what we can see here is an example of how to effectively use battering rams, and this is how to effectively use battering rams IRL as well. Uh, and you see it in the movie, in um, the attack on Helm's Deep, when the um, Orakai they kind of surround the battering ram um, with their, their shields up as well. 
in that kind of turtle formation, um, that yes, you, you surround your um, battering rams with units so that the enemy can't target the ba uh, battering rams and then you attack the outpost. That being said, axe throwers are so good against siege because they're actually melee um, units. If you didn't know that, the axe throwers are classed as melee units. They're, they're ranged melee units, a bit like um, Denethorius. So yes, they, they do melee damage. So that means that the um, damage to siege is huge, which I personally think should be changed in the next patch. So it's Lendl in... And that actually is um, an example, and that's something that I've just realized just now, so thank you, Isolendo, for pointing that out to me, is that if you go for those um, super cheap troops that you get from Denethor's ability, it, it frees up a lot of your money to get heroes, and as we see there, Isolendo has spammed out almost every hero um, that Gondor can get. Everyone in particular is so, so effective. However, um, the perfect counter to that is Thorin III, so we'll, we'll see how much damage um, he can do, and look at this damage to... Um, I thought that was a hero there, but actually it's just a normal troop. Really, Thor in the show should be attacking this Nazgul, and he is. So, actually, it doesn't seem like that much damage is being done, but his abilities are activated. And when his abilities are activated, really the damage is just ridiculous, ridic ridiculously huge. It seems here that um, the Mouth of Sauron is, is on his um, horse, so really he could be able to chase him down here. If you didn't know, he also gets more damage in armor as his life points get reduced, which is ridiculous in my opinion. But there he goes! He's down! So some flanking damage from the Nazgul and the... the um, oh my goodness me. Um, if you didn't know, these runes over here mean that um, Gothmog is level 10. And that is almost never seen in games. And that also gives Sauron a level. So let's see. He's level 9. Oh my goodness me, he's level 9. So if he can get uh, Gothor out and get another level, really um, Mordor alone will be able to turn the tide in this game. Also, it buffs your Nazgul, having them all at level 10. And indeed, he does have uh, level 10. Uh, or oh, sorry, the top tier uh, powers. And yes, he does go for Gorthor. And actually, that is his level 10. That is the level 10 right there for Sauron. So, he can turn Sauron into Gorthor here. And he can build that super, super OP um, 3.8 style fortress that he gets. And really, I personally think that it's, it's looking even in favour of um, Islendil and, and Danny in this situation. Even though you won't think it. Just the fact that... Um, Gorthar is out now at level 10. Even though um, jo um, Dud and Andy completely overwhelm um, their enemies in the number of troops that they got and the fact that they're all upgraded, really, uh, if, if um, Isolendil and Danny can hold on here, and in particular if Danny can keep his Gorthar alive, which I don't actually know where he's gone. I've actually lost Gorthar. Um, I'm sure I'll find him later. There he is, actually, having said that. If he can keep him alive. And here comes the um, the fortress. Yes, if they can hang on in this match, they really have good chances of winning. Although you wouldn't think it, um, looking at it. And if you didn't know much about the mod, you really wouldn't think it. Does it do poison damage as well? I mean, if it, it, looks, like, it looks as if it does. Unless he... Did he use some other ability? I, th I do think that is a feature of the fortress to give poison. And really, that is um, ridiculous as well. To have that zap and to have poison... Look at those um, Arivalis coming in as well. And oh my goodness me, this is terrible, terrible news for Andy. Because if he loses, think how much money is, is invested in this small clump of Imlargers here. It's thousands and thousands of, uh, of resources worth of money. And this poison is, is um, the armor is irrelevant to poison as far as I know. I don't actually know that for sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's irrelevant. It just goes straight to the HP. <laughs> Excuse me, another sip. Um, Yes, he's getting a healing in the well now, but really that was a, a big situation where he could have lost so much money. And if he had lost that small clump of Imlargis, really I would consider that GG even. Even though that um, Dud and, uh, and Andy look like they're in such a strong position now. But just look at this fortress. Just look at the zapping that's going on here. And if, if um, I think it's just randomly generated the zap or after a certain amount of time. But if he managed to zap those Imlargis units... Uh, units, as you remember, they're in a bit of a club there. If they zap them and they continue to be poisoned by the fortress, um, really that could have um, spelled defeat for uh, Andy in this situation. So look at this spam. And a lot of these units, I, I believe, I mean, these guys have got shields. You can tell that they're the cheap ones if they have no shields. But really, he's managed to keep up, keep up the spam, and it's doing reasonably well for him here. Now that he's got the heroes out, so that's something that you can consider as well. If you're the t if you're the type of player who loves hero play, and you're very good at hero play, um, and you're playing as um, Gondor, you might think of using that strategy. And here it is again of get spamming out these super super cheap and um, a little bit weaker units. They can't get upgrades if you didn't know, um, and then just spamming out heroes because you're going to be saving a lot of money in that way. So really, this is, it's an example of um, 
this game being very well made in terms of the online multiplayer is that different um, strategies and quite a few different strategies are um, viable in themselves. Whereas if you if you were going to play a game that wasn't very well made and wasn't very well balanced, you would just have one or two. And look at that, that zap. Uh, does it affect your ally units as well? It, it certainly knocked them back. And what a huge, huge club of Gondor. Oh my goodness me, that is devastating for those men of Dale, those poor men of Dale. But oh my goodness, look at this. What was that? Was that, um, yes it was. It was um, Gloin again, another epic uh, oil spill from Gloin. Um, but once again, he's lost to him. However, Faramir, oh, he's just lying down. He's just having a little nap um, in the middle of this epic battle. Uh, I thought he was dead, but he's not. He's just, he's just asleep. So yes. A very good game so far. Very, very good game. Very dynamic game. Um, what with the outposts um, coming and going as they were. But really, I, I personally have got it in favour, in my mind, of... Um, and look at these Blade Masters. Oh my goodness me. Look at all those units just get destroyed. So clearly, um, this is another great example of where you should use Blade Masters. If your enemy uses this tactic that um, Islendil is doing to get out these units through Denethor... And here is the um, power that does it, Blind Order. If you have um, Blade Masters in your army, those guys can never get um, heavy armor. So really, Blade Masters would be excellent against them, as we saw. So that was, once again, a situation where a unit that you might not think uh, is that great proved themselves to be useful. And still, the constant reign of, um, of these Forged Blade uh, Axe Throwers, who also do very well against unheavy un um, armored units. Uh, if you read that, they do more damage against enemies without heavy armor when this cutting axe is uh, available. So very, very good against Mordor and also very good against um, any unit that hasn't got um, heavy armor. So in comes Danny again, and it looks like he's constantly been losing troops um, throughout this match. However, he's managed to keep his heroes alive, as so often Danny does. And he's got all of his units at level 10 as well. All of his heroes at level 10, I should say. Um including Gothmog, which is very, very, very rare to see. And this is actually an excellent um, ability. It's just it's just hardly ever used because he hardly ever gets to level 10. I don't know what it is, but um, he, he just levels a lot slower than um, almost every other hero in this game. Uh, he also likes to die a lot. If you don't if you don't look after him because you, if you tell him to attack you do an attack order. He runs all the way to the uh, back of your enemy's forces for whatever reason. I don't know if that's if that's um, like an EA bug that the team can't fix or whether it's something that they're looking to fix in the future. Anyway, let's have a look at this thing. Attack order. Gothmog orders his orc into the last charge. Nearby orcs and siege weapons gain plus 60% attack damage and suffer only 25% damage from archers and siege weapons. So really that is uh, that is huge and it, it's the idea behind it is to launch a huge attack on your enemy and try and siege him as um, that is Gothrog's mole in, mole in the rubies. Yes. Mole in the Ruvies. I hope you understood what I meant there. Um, there goes Nori. Rip Nori. And here comes uh, the Army of the Dead. Oh my goodness me. From BFME 1 to modern day Dane. The Army of the Dead is OPAF. And long may it remain OPAF in my opinion. It won't be uh, Balf Middle-earth without everything getting killed by the Army of the Dead. Horrible to play against. And just so fun to play with. Um, that wasn't an innuendo. So, here we go. And actually, this is... What is he... What is he doing here? He, is he trying to harass... Oh, oh, of course. He's, he's just simply running from the Army of the Dead. And that was a nice example of using the speed boost there to run against the Army of the Dead. So, yes, they're very good. And look at that zap. Really, that's an excellent example of why the zap is good because it, it, uh, it gives a knockback so you can't run away as you can't run away from uh, the Army of the Dead there. So, yes, that is the counter to the Army of the Dead. Yes, they're excellent. And dwarves will never be able to run away from the Army of the Dead. That is why siege, um, siege is so important. That is why speed is so important um, in this game and in RTS in general. Being able to run, being able to choose when to fight, essentially, is what it is. You get to choose. If you're winning, you get to choose to continue to fight. Um, and it forces your enemy into fighting if they're slower than you. But if you're losing, you can choose to run away. Really, that is um, sp speed in RTS in a crux. And that is the um, the way to counter um, the Army of the Dead, if you can. And that is to um, get some kind of a speed boost. Now here you see um, Danny is all the way over on this side of the map now. Um, because it's a lender that has successfully taken down Dud's um, Dale. So once again, the outposts are switched. And this is what I love to see. I, I, I love to see it that uh, the outposts don't decide the game. 
I love to see that the outposts um, get taken down and get rebuilt and it's dynamic and fun in that way, at least in my opinion. And look at this, the eagles being summoned over the um, axe throwers. Now, axe throwers are good at range and they can deal huge damage to the eagles. However, he used fear so they're all running away. Now, here you can see the golden glow of Thorin the Third. What level is he? Level 6. When he gets to level 7, he will be able to destroy this entire army in one move. And this is the move, Revenge. It's just ridiculous, um, and hopefully we get to see it, and you get to see why it is so ridiculous. Now, the one counteract to um, Thorin is once again speed. So he's an he's an overpowered unit, but he suffers um, in slow speed, a little bit like the army of the dead. So he's getting attacked, and I mean, you're never going to run away from eagles, no matter how fast you are. Um, but yes, he can get chased down by um, units. So a good way to counter Thorin the Third, which ironically, the, the fact that he's um, a hero killer... I, I, ironically enough, um, it's to spam heroes against him and really um, like surround him with heroes and get loads, lots of flank damage in. Once he gets onto red health, then you really chase him down and he can't run away from you. Another great thing is cavalry versus him. Um, because once again, it's even more difficult for him to run away against cavalry. And really cavalry against heroes is a good counter all round. So it seems as if Danny wasn't um, successful in pushing on this um, outpost over here and he said he's decided to come over and try and fight together with Isselendil um, and potentially they might be thinking about trying to get rid of Dud in, in, at this point because Dud has really suffered quite a lot of damage oh look at this this is always nice to see the veterans of the last alliance um, I, I hardly get I hardly ever get them and also the wind riders even better to see I hardly ever get um, these two units um, the heroic units they cost a lot of money and they're not that tanky um, as you might think however of course with with good micro um, I'm sure they are excellent and if you can level them up in particular as is the case with all heroic units um, they just become extremely extremely good but at level one um, they can be vulnerable to, um, say, an archer spam because you can really just focus them down and every single archer unit in every single battalion of archers you have attacks them all at the same time and really they suffer huge damage. So they're not they're not so good when they're isolated by themselves, but if, if they're in a decent clump of an army or if they're cavalry and you can easily escape, then yes, heroic units are extremely good. It's another one of those situations where in certain situations they're bad, in certain situations they're good. And you just have to decide uh, what is optimal for you in the situation. And look at this. Talking about optimal um, counters and op optimal things to use in situations. That flood um, is considered not that great by a lot of players. But against Mordor, it is devastating. Look at how many troops he lost there. And I didn't know what he was on before, but now he's, he's on 592, which is very low for Mordor. And... Um, it seems that the spam of Isselendil is relentless because he's, he's on 1,800 despite the amount of fighting that he's done. And he's, he's managing to outspam Mordor here, um, his ally being Mordor. But also, uh, this is um, Andy here. He's got loads and loads of command points, 1,690. So it's almost a complete opposite. Dud is reason doing reasonably okay as well on just about 1,000. So it's, it's almost a complete opposite where you'd think that Mordor had the most um, command points. But really, he's um, a lot lower. However, to counter that fact, he's got all these um, heroes out with his core for at level 10, which I still believe is going to uh, play a huge role in this match. And part of the role that he played was he saved Isselendil, really, in my opinion. Um, in that little fight up there when they were fighting, um, all, all four of them together were fighting up there, Isselendil was in real trouble. Um, a lot of his army was killed. Um, Dud, Dud was building a seriously, seriously strong force and he was getting ready to um, really take the fight to Isselendil and potentially win on that side of the map. The fact that um, Gorfar came out and used his um, citadel was huge in allowing Isselendil to um, survive and actually rebuild and get so many more units out. Now Danny's on the back foot, Isselendil is repaying the favour and he's actually coming in to try and, what it would seem like, do a bit of a base rush here on Andy. And really how is Andy going to counter this in this situation? Here's an example of these um, heroic units, these heroic cavalry in this case. Yes, they're very good, but if they get completely sur surrounded and they get completely outnumbered, they're going to die just like everything else. Um, and oh, so he has countered it by using um, his his other level ten power, which is the the, um, the last alliance of men and elves. So he's got a lot of uh, extremely good heroes out, and he's got a lot of very good units. But once again, he's just getting outnumbered by this spam. Um, so really, uh, 
this is looking very, very dangerous here for Andy in this situation. That yes, he's summoned these. Now, they don't actually last that long, uh, the you last alliance. So, I wouldn't be too concerned if I was Isolendal in this position. I'm sure he isn't. And here's um, Aragorn at level 7, which is very nice to see. I don't think he's actually got Gandalf out yet uh, in this match. And indeed, I do believe he hasn't. I haven't seen him, and he's, he's still at the city level, so he hasn't got him at the moment. Um, so, I mean, in the meantime... Um, and he has destroyed this outpost down here, which, okay, you've destroyed an outpost, but if your base gets destroyed, I would take that um, trade any day from a Cylindor perspective. But in comes, look at that clump of uh, dwarves to come in and try and save the day. Uh, I, I try to save Andy in this match. Now, if, now, if any one player gets knocked out in a 2v2, um, it's GG. Unless you can instantly knock someone else out. As we saw in that game that I posted, and look at this, um, the, the Rohan answers... They answer the call against the dwarves and oh my dear god, I do believe he's got no pikes in there. He's got no bloody pikes. Oh dear god. Rip. Rip, 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 rip. Shelob comes out, which, which is actually probably a bit of a mistake from Danny because he just knocked all these units back. But wow, that was that was excellent, excellent use of um, the Rohirrim there. I don't know if that was planned or it was just a coincidence, but the fact that uh, Dud had absolutely no pikes, the Rohan cavalry there was the perfect counter. Now, this is another situation again where sometimes you might think that the uh, Rohan cavalry, and I actually believe as well, that the Rohan cavalry... Um, you know, all things considered, is is probably a lot less effective than the Army of the Dead. However, in this situation, the Rohan army was just infinitely better than uh, the Army of the Dead because he had no pikes and their cavalry. So really, it's about picking your uh, powers, picking your army compositions, picking the heroes that you go for, uh, picking your whole meta um, to really counter your opponent is is what you what you have to do to become truly truly excellent at, at, at any rts game and really that is something that i need to improve on as well i tend to just go for one strategy um, and just kind of bang my head against a wall and use it know that it's good know that i can beat a lot of players with it but um i'm i sometimes struggle to switch up my strategy like i hardly ever use um tower guards in the early game even if it might be more effective for me to do so so that's something that i definitely have to have a look at um in a day and in every rts game um that is played um every good rts game that is if you've got a bad rts game uh, it, it's bad because it's unbalanced and therefore there will just be one thing that's completely um overpowered and you just use that and win so, really that's what makes um, RTS games great, in my opinion. I mean, th there's other factors, like um, just how epic it is, and Idain has definitely got that um, locked down to a T. And here goes Andy's base, and actually Andy has been defeated, and they quit. So they called it GG. So they knew that Andy's base was being destroyed, and that is exactly what I was saying. If you lose someone in, in a 2v2, it's almost over for you. So they knew at that point it was over, and of course, Dud's army was completely destroyed by Rohan. So an excellent game. In fact, one of the best games I've ever seen, particularly um, one of the best 2v2s I've ever seen, just because of how dynamic it was, how um, the kind of the game ebbed and flowed, and at one point, um, Danny and Isolendil were winning in the early game. There was an epic comeback from Dud and Andy doing some epic micro combinations, and then um, Gorthar came out with his level ten um, fortress to save Isolendil, who repaid Danny the favor by destroying Andy and Gigi. So an excellent, excellent game. So thank you, Isolendil, for sending that to me. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I'll be back with some more subscribers games in the future. So send me your replays. I've got, I believe, one more, or maybe two more. Yes, I think two more, because I think Dimitri sent me another one. So I've got some more um, in the pipeline, but I will run out because I'm constantly making them. So yes, send me your replays. Um, I'll do some more live action. I'll do some more uh, replays of my games as well. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and goodbye.